I am really excited for this one because it's one of the first times that we get to ask some really good questions to a, a publisher that um, we all love at this channel, Boom Studios. Ross Ritchie, thank you for joining us, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. We, we usually get started um, on these interviews, at least whenever I'm doing interviews. I like to, to ask uh, the obvious question, if you remember your very first comic book. Um, so oh, I'll never forget my first comic. It was my mom uh, had an Easter basket for me when I was six years old, and it had a copy of Fantastic Four number 178 and uh, Captain America 207 in it. And uh, she had cut open the Easter basket and had put the comics in. And um, I was just utterly like I, so I had a very strong reaction. So the cap story, and maybe I got the number wrong, but basically in the issue, Nazis were putting people into ovens. Oh, yeah. So I don't even remember that one. Six. Yeah. It was when Jack came back for the second run in the late seventies. Like this is post Matt bomb saga. And, um, so he was frying people in ovens and Jack's artwork with Reuters inks was so bold that I just couldn't take it. And I was kind of out on Jack Kirby until um, I was like 23. And then I'm right there with you, I came back. Now I had the great fortune of meeting Jack like four times and loved him. So I have Jack autographs and the whole nine yards. So I was really thrilled, <clears throat> excuse me. So love Jack. But when I was six, boy, howdy, that was too much for me. And um, now the flip side, uh, see what I did there? Yeah. So we'll have to keep that. the uh, the uh, I, on the the Fantastic Four, I remember really clearly being six and looking at the corner box and seeing 178, and I thought, huh, if that means that there's 177 before this, I've got to read every single one of them. Oh wow, yeah. Because let's let's look at this through the six year old viewpoint. One guy's made of rocks, and one guy's made of fire. Yeah. Right? So which guy do I want to be? I want to be them both, right? And my dad was an engineer, and so Reed Richards being a scientist was you know a huge plus. Yeah. And you get to go on adventures with your family, and that particular issue is like a dog pile of characters. It's like the frightful five are in it. Um, the the Counter Earth brute from Counter Earth, who's a different version of Reed Richards, is in it. Uh, Tigra, Thundra. I mean, it had Roy Thomas put like 80 million characters in it. It's drawn by George Perez. George is a personal friend. We published George. I adore the man. He's one of my heroes. That. You know, yeah. It just set me on fire, and I loved it, and I never turned back. Now, for the quick answer of how I got into comics, so I'm going to quote Mark Wade, which Mark says that the uh, the minute that comics somebody breaks into comics, comics goes over and seals that way to do it shut to prevent anybody else from getting in ever in that way. So it's, it's a crazy story. Uh, I graduated from film school, University of Texas in Austin, moved out to Los Angeles, worked as a assistant on this, that, and the other, a bunch of things that nobody cares about, nobody remembers. And then I uh, went to a comic book convention. I was living on my credit cards. I couldn't pay my bills, trying to break into the movie business. And um, I went to a comic book convention and um, it was a uh, one put on in Riverside, which it was never put on again. So, um, you know, go figure. And uh, there was a Malibu Comics booth there and they were pushing the Ultraverse. And I got into a conversation with the guy at the booth. I had no idea. He was the director of their film division. So they had a film division for 10 minutes. Okay. And their plan was they were going to make straight to video movies based on their characters. And they made a trailer based on their character hard case that was yeah. from the verse. And so I was talking to this guy about, you know, that's shot on 35 millimeter. It's not shot on 16. And I had shot on 16 when I was in college and, you know, we were just having a film nerd conversation. And then this guy's like, Hey, do you want a job? And so he wanted to hire me for the film division. And so basically I was like, yeah, great. I want to work in the movie business. And so I quit what I was doing. Uh, I think I was working for like, I can't remember, but it was like the home entertainment division at Disney or something like that, you know, um, checking boxes. And, um, and by the time I took the job at Malibu, when I showed up, they'd shuttered the film division because oh. the sales on the first item, which was firearm, which was written by James Robinson, uh, were so bad that it basically the division wasn't going to work. And, um, so I show up and they're like, you're in the marketing department. And so 
I had knew nothing about marketing and, uh, but I needed a job. So thank God. And I learned mm -hmm. about marketing. I learned, I enjoyed it and I had a blast and, you know, I had this tremendous opportunity, which was, you know, let's talk about the creators that are working at the ultraverse at this time period. And, and Malibu. I was just going to ask that because shout out to John Z of the Flipside crew loves Malibu or the ultraverse and Malibu stuff. And we all talk about that early Malibu stuff. So I was getting ready to jump in there, pick your brain about some of that stuff. Mind blowing, you know, like, okay. So Steve Gerber who created Howard the duck mm -hmm. is one of the most important comic book writers of the past 50 years, uh, massively influential. I've sat with Grant Morrison and had conversations about Steve Gerber and how much Grant was influenced by Steve Gerber. Yeah. So um, Steve Gerber, huge Steve Englehart, um, massive huge impact on pretty much every single big two character uh, outside of spider-man you know big justice league runs very important on captain america i could go on and on and on huge influence on batman laughing fish is Steve yeah. Engelhardt, right steve Englehart. uh then uh you know uh i worked with jim hudnell great dude james robinson was brand new um great dude Starman, incredible i love this star man you know, it was clear i know i'm going to be forgetting people mike barr uh tremendously talented uh did that epic uh batman year two run that i love so much i love batman and the outsiders um and then um beyond that with bravura i became personal friends with howard shaken walter simonson i was working with jim starlin the great uh, gil kane the co-creator yeah we should go back for a second so howard shaken go look him up american flag the guy's a genius he completely changed the business the visual vocabulary the inset panel um that's a different podcast right um the, 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 it, basically the assertion is howard used inset panels in comic book artwork in such a way that it was influential on return of the dark knight and frank miller who was in his studio at the time he was doing American Flag. Wow. Which a lot of the graphic techniques that Frank used in Return of the Dark Knight, um, and he did a bunch of innovations as well, so I'm not trying to minimize Frank Miller. He's a hero of mine. And, yeah. And, and I published his Robocop stuff, so I adore the man. But basically, that changed the business. Jim Starlin, who we know from the Infinity Gauntlet saga and Warlock, and uh, I'm a huge fan of Dreadstar, worked with him. Um, Walter Simonson, Beta Ray Bill, Thor, I don't need to explain to you who he is, a delightful dude. Um, and so it was, and, and then one of the biggest was Barry Windsor Smith, who yes. um, I just adore and was uh, heroically kind to me and very supportive. And all these people were really great to me and very encouraging and very kind and really supported a 23, 24, 25 year old kid who looked like I'd come from Seattle grunge scene with hair down to my shoulders and, you know, uh, a punk ass, you know, Gen X attitude and was really terrific. And so that's how I broke into comics. I, I left a little bit before Marvel, actually, excuse me, Marvel bought the company and then I hung around for a while and then I quit before they kind of shuttered everything. Yeah. And so I uh, had a tremendous experience through that with worked with a bunch of, you know, great people at Marvel, Dan Buckley, one of them who ascended to become um, Grand Poobah, uh, chief dude over at Marvel, who's terrific and wonderful. So tremendous experience, um, uh, worked with a constellation of incredible talented people. And, and I, I also feel like that time was probably one of the like major time in comics history, just because of what was changing in the background of comics. We all know what happened in the foreground, like with the art and the creators and everything that was going on. But in the background, in, in the business room, you know, you had a lot of these new startups happening, right? You had, like you, you talk about, and and all these great things um, to cause, I guess where we're at now with uh, publishers like Boom Studios, you know, taking on the big two um, and, and wanting to put out amazing material with these creators who were um i don't know if the word was tired of working for the big two but you know well, wanted let's, let's put some context to it okay if, if, if i beg your pardon yes so, so the so basically you know part of this i want to talk about is um paul levitz who uh, ran the business side of dc comics for 30 years and became the president of dc comics uh, and is, of course, a legendary comic book writer. 
So Paul's one of my mentors and, you know, Paul uh, really shaped and helped create the environment where the comic book stores could flourish. And so going back to the 1970s, what was happening was the, um, the stores were buying for comic shops from the newsstand. So they were buying from newsstand distributors and they were buying in bundles of 60. Yeah. So that was the environment. Now they could send things back, but then in the seventies, Phil Suling went forward and he said, what if I, he, he went to Marvel and he said, what if I buy direct from you? And that's where the term direct market comes from is I'm going to buy direct from you. And Marvel said, well, we don't care. And Phil said, because your, your numbers were too small, their print runs were like 500,000 copies and, yeah. and Phil wanted to buy 10,000 copies. And Phil said, well, what if they're non-returnable? And they said, oh, you would buy these books from us and you couldn't send them back? Okay, we'll make that deal. We'll sell to you direct. And that broke up in the direct market system. So that's the mid 70s. And then by the 80s, Paul really, well, heading into the late 70s, early 80s, Paul really recognizes that this is uh, gonna become one of the dominant forces in comics. And so he starts to create an environment uh, where uh, it's more tailored to the retailers. Now, concurrent with this is the creation of Pacific Comics and Eclipse mm -hmm. Comics. And so why this is important, the first part, 1978, uh, Sabre is published. And the writer on Sabre is Don McGregor, who's a Marvel writer, extremely influential. Another influence on Grant Morrison, by the way. Yeah. His run on Black Panther, Panther's Rage, is considered maybe one of the first graphic novels that was serialized and uh, was influential on Grant. And so uh, Don McGregor and Paul Gulacy. Uh, so Paul, uh, I don't know if it's Gulacy or Gulacy. Gulacy, yeah. Okay. So, I, I'm right there with you. I, I'm not sure either, but I definitely know the name. So Paul was working on Master of Kung Fu which is Shang-Chi, uh, so that comes back around now. And so Paul uh, and Don did a graphic novel called Saber, which was sold direct to comic shops, which is groundbreaking. And that's the first publication from Eclipse. So that's the first time that you see big two creators leaving the big two to go work for an independent. And then shortly thereafter, Pacific launches, and Pacific launches with Jack Kirby. I was just about and to I'm, say, yeah, I'm Jack Kirby. I, I, yeah. I was just going through books the other day and finding a bunch of those, yeah. And so that was very influential on me as a reader. And so I got really excited about uh, the kinds of stories that you could tell, because what was happening was there was an experimentation with things beyond superheroes. Uh, Saber was not a superhero. Uh, Captain Victory kind of not really, you know, Captain Victory was science fiction and space opera in a way that I loved from Star Wars and from Star Trek. And so that really, um, rather than sort of the, typical capes and tights and secret identity stuff that I grew up with. So that was very influential to me. And so by the mid eighties, you have this proliferation of publishers and the big moment is the turtles. So yes. the turtles are 84 and it's a black and white comic and it's done with earnestness and heart. Um, but it's not the most polished looking thing. And I think uh, Eastman and Laird would tell you that it's not the most polished looking thing. And it's such a hit that there's this tremendous, um, energy put into publishing. So yes. everyone goes, let's, you know, let's try our thing. Yeah. And so that changes the landscape. And I think in particular, the success of the early independents like Pacific and Eclipse, but then married to the way that the turtles uh, become a cartoon and a video game and a movie, I think really influenced the image creators. And oh, yeah the pattern of, you know, Jack Kirby, Don McGregor, Paul Gulacy, these guys leaving to go do independent comics. But then the self-publishing that Eastman and Laird did with the Turtles creates image. And, and, and so the other big thing to remember in this era is the first Tim, ba Tim Burton Batman movie is 1989. Yep. And sales go up, and it's very similar to what's happened with the big run of Marvel and DC movies and TV shows now, yeah, where it, it brought, a, brought a real influx of new fans. And so in this late 80s, now that's when I become a speculator. Is and we'll it's, kind of, it's kind of like what's going on right now with, and, and your perfect timing where you say that's where you became a speculator. Like everybody right now is kind of 
going through that same type of thing where you see a lot of people joining because of every, like you said, with the TV and the movies and all, you know, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has thrown everything. It created, uh, it kind of like history repeating itself, right? Well, I just think it's human pattern is like it's there's all this excitement. You see these great stories that you love and then you go to the headwaters and you realize there's a bunch of great stories in comics yes. and then you become involved in that. You become in collecting, uh, involved in collecting. So let's can 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 we jump to the I'm conversation about speculation? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. So I'll tell you my story about speculation. So I am like 19 when the Tim Burton movie comes out. So by the time I'm 20, um, I'm getting back into comics. I had kind of cycled out and I was going to a local comic shop and they had the, the Todd McFarlane first issue of Spider-Man was marked up and I can't remember if it was 10 bucks or 12 bucks or what it was. And I went to 7-Eleven and I walked by 7-Eleven and they had copies on the rack for $1.75. So I remember thinking now both my mom is an entrepreneur and my dad, Light bulb. Is an entrepreneur, right? And so I go, ah, oh, if I spend, if I buy 10 copies of the $1.75 thing, I wonder if I can go wholesale it back to the comic shop owner. And sure enough, he gave me store credit. And so what I would start to do, he gave me a 30% discount. So what I would start to do is buy Jim Lee X-Men. Uh, you know, it was like they were a dollar book. So I was paying 70 cents. I had pre order 10 copies. Um, and I would put, I'd fill out my previews order form. Wow. Right? And I was pre ordering, you know, I was, I was like one of the best customers, right? Because I was reading everything. I loved Independence and a bunch of Marvel DC stuff. So, so I pre-order all that stuff. And so, what would happen is, you know, um, within a month, those Jim Lee X Men books were ten bucks. Mm -hmm. And so, for a starving college student to be able to take seven dollars and turn it into seventy bucks, now he was giving me store credit. And so, what I did with the store credit was I built a Silver Age collection. And so I, he had all these Silver Age books that nobody was buying because it was his clientele was college students. And that was too old to everybody. It was like th those were the old janky comics that looked like yep. they were antiques. And so he was psyched that I was taking his Silver Age Green Lantern comics off of his hands. And he was getting Jim Lee X-Men, which is selling like hotcakes. And so it was this sort of virtuous cycle where I was able to pre-order so I didn't catch him with his pants down. And then, you know, I would come back and get get him things that he needed. And then that got rid of stuff that he couldn't get rid of. Everybody's happy. Right. And so yep. that then um, goes to, I pre-order X-Force number one. So now we're in 1991. Yep. And I pre-order, and now for, for fun, for the audience, this is the polybagged book that has five different kinds of cards in it. It's the same comic on the inside, same cover, right? And I pre-ordered that, and I think I pre-ordered 35 copies of that, so seven <laughs> sets, right? And that just hit like a, you know, like lead. Like I really, remember it. Yeah. Really I cared about that book, right? You hit it right on the head with talking about the bags and the cards. Everybody did the same exact thing. We all bought all seven, all the whole set. Yep. I, we probably still have them bagged and boarded in the poly bag. Yep, yep. And so when that hit, I was like, oh, this is over, right? Like I spent this money, I'm never getting it back. Like I'm gonna be eating these things. And you know, my risk tolerance was tiny. Yeah, right? yeah. And so I punched out and then, you know, fast forward to like two years later, I'm working at Malibu. And you know, you have these moments when you're working at a comic book company where you realize how many they print, right? And, and so that really cooled me on that. And then uh, the bust happens in like, I want to say it's like 96. Yeah. And so that, that kind of, I go through the cycle, but of course I keep reading comics. And, and so let's talk about speculation here for a second, because I, I know that that's a lightning rod and a, and a third rail for a, a lot of my, my retailer friends. And what I would say to your audience is I would really encourage your audience to pre-order with your retailer so that they're not caught off guard. Now the flip is I want to say to the retailers, I really want to encourage them to um, take control of their store. You know, I shop at Comic Bug in Culver City, California, and they do this great job. They put up a little sign that says limit one per person. Mm -hmm. And they strictly enforce it and have told me stories about 
a speculator will come buy a copy, then walk outside and get a, they're right next to a liquor store. So they'll get some guy from the liquor store to come in and try to buy the issue and comic bug will shut it down and be like, no, 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 no. You know, now the thing you need to, with speculators, what you need to understand is the central most important thing for comic shop retailers is that they take care of their regulars. Okay. There's nothing that's more important and that should be important to you too, because that's the customer base that in week in week out that enables these guys to be in business and we all know they're not millionaires we all know that they they're sometimes they're up and sometimes they're down and we need our local comic shops we need these guys to survive yes. and so what i would really encourage your audience on the speculator end is to work with your local retailer have empathy and understand that if you're going in and you're disrupting their sales pattern that that's injurious. Like, look at it from a store owner perspective. From their perspective, they want every customer to have a positive experience. Yes. And so if there's a store regular who comes in and he says, you know, where's the book? And there's some guy in the parking lot with 10 copies and the retailer ordered 10, you know, that's a negative experience. Now I would say to the retailer, limit it. I, I know sometimes retailers put the book behind the counter and they wait for somebody to ask, and and I've you know I've patronized stores that do that, and I and I think that's a great tool um, to be able to sort of like give the sniff test to the person who's asking. Yes. And and I think sometimes as a speculator, if you're patient, and the store is able to cover their regulars, and they have extra copies, then they relax a little bit because really you got to keep in mind what they're trying to do is take care of their core customers. Yes, I know I'm talking about a lot of controversial stuff. I know that there's dudes that run shops where they they yank books off the rack and they put them up on eBay and don't sell them to their customers. And I don't know what to say about any of that. Yeah, but well, I think you hit it on the head about um, how stores rely on their regulars. And as a speculator and, and a, reg, a store regular, I think that is only fair. I think I think anybody who disagrees with the the idea that they want you know to limit them so they can uh, give it to their store regulars is just being an asshole. Let's be honest. Uh, excuse my French, but let's look at it that it, fair. Let's be fair about this. They have, and and you also put it a great point that we we have things available to us to. Um, help both sides, right? And that being previews and FOC. Yes. And a, a lot of the guys out there right now that are playing the speculator game heavy are playing the FOC game. And in doing so, you can help out your shop by doing your FOC through that shop. And then you really don't have to worry about going in there and being limited on your books, right? Oh, absolutely. And look, you know, the, the thing to me is... You know, I would encourage if you're going to play the market. So let's let's not misconstrue for one second that I'm saying play the market. I am mm -hmm. not saying play the market. Yeah. Okay. But people play the market, and I did 30 years ago, so mm -hmm. I know what that is. Okay. And the thing about it is, is sharpen your skills about predicting what is the future. Yes. You know, I will forever be proud of there was a solicit solicitation for uh, Mike Allred's legendary independent series, Madman. Mm -hmm. And I saw that in the, in the catalog and was like over the moon, excited about it, pre-ordered the book and have bought everything that Mike Allred's done for the past 30 years. And boy, is Mike Allred tired of me telling him that. <laughs> but the, the thing is, is, um, you know, the, if you're going to play the trend game, then get good at predicting trends. Yes. And, and so one of the things is using the pre-order tool with your local comic shop. Like you've got to create a relationship with your local comic shop and support them. And antagonizing them makes these, um, what, what they are is they're hubs of culture and community. Uh, they recruit new fans to read comics, which helps uh, the entire market. And um, you don't want to go in and disrupt uh, the thing that is uh, supporting the publishers, the creators, the creators depend upon this. 
you yes. know, if we're disruptive and we poop where we eat, uh, that creates a negative scenario that hurts everybody. Yeah. And, so, and not only that, um, you another hit, you hit it right on the head with the community aspect. Like our, our local shops are the places where we got into this. Like a lot of, a lot of us re, uh, forget that where we come from, we come from, uh, being those little local shop rats. And when you create that relationship with the shop owner, not only are you helping the shop owner and you're helping um, comics in general, that shop owner is going to give you a call whenever he's got a collection in, right? He's going to give you, when you walk in the store and he goes, hey, I just got some new uh, books in, go ahead and take a look at them. Or, hey, man, this comic is going to be crazy. You need to, something to go in the children is really good. You need to buy a couple of these, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, okay. I have a relationship with um, my local uh, comic shop retailer that has become one of the best relationships. Not, I mean, he's one of my best friends in general because of that relationship that I've created with him. Yeah. Um, and I feel like, unfortunately, with what we're going through right now, it's even harder but the community aspect is the most important part. And if we don't have that community aspect, we have nothing because it just falls away. And secondly, reading. I, th I think a lot of speculators don't read enough, including myself. I don't read enough to be really good at the speculation game. If you want to be really good at that game, you need to read. Yeah, no, I, I think it's super important because this is a narrative art form. Yes. And so, you know, look, I, I don't know anything, so I'm just some guy, okay? But what I would say is, you know, there's probably easier ways to make money, right? And I think part of this is, and this is, again, I'm some guy, I'm not a speculator. I was 30 years ago, so I'm going to hear about it in the comments section <laughs> or, and yell at me on Twitter, all right? So caveat, caveat, I know nothing, okay? But I think that part of this is we love comics. Yes. OK, and we love talking about comics and we love collecting comics. And it's a bit the analogy I always draw is that this is like sports talk radio, right? Yeah. Where it's like you get guys, they're hanging out. They love their NFL team. They bet a couple bucks with their bro over beers. Right. They're playing with a little bit of money that doesn't get the wife mad at them. Mm -hmm. Right. And 20 bucks turns into two hundred dollars. And you know, with this is it's like, hey, I love comics. I'm buying comics. I might buy a couple of extras or I might buy something that I wouldn't ordinarily. You know, I'll tell you, nothing gets me interested in a comic book that I've never looked at, like limit one per customer. Yeah, but great point. About it with staff members at Boom, we'll be we'll go to the store and we'll come back and I'll be like, I got this thing. and I don't know what it is, but it's limit one per customer. So let's try it out, you know, yep. because people are excited about it. And and I do that in cooperation with the store. Yeah. Right? But the thing is, is what I see is I'm really excited about comics. I'm collecting comics. I've got a bunch of series that I'm reading, right? And then I buy a couple extra over here and then I'm going to try to sell them on eBay and it'll give me a little bit more money to buy more comics that I love. And I think doing that in an environment that collaborates with the retailer and is supportive of the retail community and isn't done in a disruptive way is the way to go about it. You know, and create yeah. the relationship, support the community. It's how we're all here. It affects publishers, it affects creators, and it affects the retailer. So take care of your retailer. They'll take care I, of you. I, I couldn't agree more. I think that um, our whole community needs to do more to uh, help the retailer. And I, I want to bring this up real quick just because it's perfect timing. It's a nice segue. And you at Boom Studios are doing amazing stuff to help these retailers. Thank you. Um, and one of the things that you're doing here is I'm going to bring this up is you do the support your local comic shop on the website. And I was playing around with this earlier and you guys have, I mean, you can basically just scroll in on any area and you'll find comic places that sell comics around you. And it's mind blowing because I'm finding I'm over in Phoenix here and I'm finding places that I didn't realize sell comics. <laughs> good, good, good. Well, you know, we launched this when the shutdown happened. Yes. And the reason that we launched it was a way to um, do safe shopping. And so, you know, curbside pickup, you know, what stores were open. And what we wanted to do was to support our retailers. And so 
we knew that creating a digital tool on the site was one of the things that we could do instantly that could we could push through our social channels uh, to tell fans to go support their local retailer. And so yeah. that was a big one. When the shutdown happened, we also uh, extended returnability Ooh. across more titles further. And part of what we were looking at was here's like the shutdown's happening. We have absolutely no idea if it's going to end. Okay, first of all. And then second of all, here's these retailers. They're going to have to open up at some time. And when you do, are any, is anybody going to show up? And, yeah. you know, thank God what happened was the fans supported their shop. And I think all the things that we're talking about, the fans did, which was they bought a couple of extra books. They bought a back issue off of the wall. And they helped retailers because all I'm hearing from retailers this year is that they're up. Yes. And that's not to say everybody's up. There's, you know, everybody's in a different scenario in a different community. But I'm very, seeing very consistently um, that retailers on on the whole are up. Yeah. And, and so getting through that process, what we wanted to do was we wanted to say, hey, we're aligned with comic shops. They're taking a risk buying non-returnable product. And nobody knows this COVID situation, what the hell's going on, okay? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the risk away and we're gonna support these shops and um, through that process, give them the ability to order books and not be worried and not uh, cut to the bare minimum. Because the other flip side is on the way after the shutdown to build up, we're gonna need retailers to have product to sell. Yes. Okay? So there's no point in opening the shop and then there's nothing there and at the time, you know, Marvel had cut their output way down, if not completely. And the other thing that had happened was DC was taking like a month's worth of books and was spreading it out over six weeks. And I know that both of them were listening to retailers because retailers were really worried about opening back up. Now, I went the other way. Now, I'm fond of saying that the name of my company is not Whimper. <laughs> So I'm not known for being uh, a middle of the road kind of guy. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we, we thought, we theorized that retailers would need stuff to sell. So we didn't back off. We doubled down. And so we, for example, we, we um, put more Power Rangers publishing. We basically with the entire years worth of Power Rangers publishing, we put out despite being shut down for two months. So we had some double shipping months with putting out product. Now, the other thing we did was, we sat, we sat around and looked at, we had James Tynan, and we were talking earlier about uh, Tynan's last name is pronounced Tynan, not Tinian. Yeah, remember this, guys. This will help you. I'm telling you. <laughs> so, um, so James Tynan had a book called Wind, W-Y-N-D. It was a graphic novel series that we were doing at Boom. And it was originally slated to come out in November. And we, Philip Sablik and Matt Gagnon and I, there we go, um, we're sitting around talking and we we're like, you know, what we need to do is we need to take this thing and we need to break it into individual issues and we need to put it into the direct market uh, because there's this opportunity to have more product. So I called Tynan and I said, hey, I got a crazy idea. And, and Tynan's always up for a crazy idea, thank God. <laughs> um, but the thing that was truly remarkable about this was that we skipped the usual solicitation uh, cycle so it never hit the previous catalog. And we went straight to digital with this and went straight to FOC and we only did it in five days. Wow. So basically between the announcement that we were doing it and orders being due was five days, which is complete and utter insanity. Yeah, that's nuts. And yeah, like I say, name of the company is not Whimper. <laughs> and that book turned into the biggest original launch that we'd had. It launched, the first issue launched higher than Something's Killing Children, it launched higher than Once a Future, and uh, all those other books that we had launched uh, to date. Uh, uh, the other one was um, Faithless was a huge launch. Yeah. And so um, retailers and fans really responded to that, and that was a huge kickoff. And then that led into um, doing Seven Secrets number one, which was, then became our best seller and outsold wind. And then on top of that, uh, we only find them when we're dead launched. And that was just blew the roof off the house. Oh yeah. So, and, and I think we were really fortunate in that we had really pushed in and doubled down on the direct market. 
And I think that there was a lot of folks that uh, were, you know, had pulled back. And so we found ourselves in a situation where um, this is going to be one of the best years that Boom's ever had. And it was a tremendous uh, moment. Of course, then we launched, we, we, we announced Berserker and then we launched uh, yeah. the Kickstarter, right? And so uh, we knew that that was going to be a giant thought bomb uh, for everybody. And, um, you know, in particular, the way that we arranged Berserker was that we kickstarted the collections, uh, not the individual issues. And we had commissioned the original issues and were pretty far along in the production path. Um, and so the idea wasn't to uh, crowdfund it. The idea was that we were going to do pre-orders digitally and that uh, Kickstarter is a great platform because it enables you to sell the graphic novels directly to people that don't read comic books that are maybe Keanu Reeves fans uh, that could go check it out. And it turned into a huge hit. We got, uh, I think our final total was 14,000 fans bought comics. And, you know, I don't know how many of those folks have never read a comic book before, but um, I, I'll put it this way. I specifically worked on the design. The lowest tier was $50. Now, $50 got you three graphic novels. And I think our price point ultimately is going to be $14.99. So basically, the lowest tier was more expensive than your local comic shop. Okay. Really? And you have to pay shipping on top of it. Okay. Which you don't have to pay at your local comic shop. Yeah. yeah. So we basically disincentivized comic book fans in comic stores from buying from the Kickstarter. The Kickstarter was designed. It's not as good a deal as you can get at your local comic shop. And so um, I would think that the vast majority of the 14,000 people that signed up for this, you know, they would not want to, you know, pay extra, Like it's designed so that if you've never read a comic book before, you can just click once and then you get all three volumes sent to you when they're finished. And so that's like three different shipping windows. So that way we serialize the comic in the direct market first. Okay. Then the collection goes to the comic shops. The collection goes to the book trade. We have a book distribution with Simon and Schuster, and then it goes to the Kickstarter. Okay. So that way we keep the windows discreet. Retailers are supported. And we now have an email list where we can email the people that sign the 14,000 fans and say, Hey, we're sending you the graphic novel, but that's going to be like six months, maybe nine months from now. Yeah. So if you don't want to wait, you can go to your local comic shop and Oh, by the way, here are all the different variants. Cause we're going to have different variants. Maybe you like one of the covers, maybe you want to collect whatever. And what we did before we launched this was we talked to uh, 15 retailers. I personally called them, that are some of the most outspoken retailers or uh, folks that we've had relationships with through the years and basically talked them through the program and said, you know, let us know if you think that this has any weaknesses to it. Let us know if this doesn't provide help to you in different ways and uh, got some great ideas. But for the most part, uh, all of them were excited about the program. That's uh, exactly where I was going to go. My first question on this was because you have such a good relationship with your retailers. Um, and obviously, I imagine your retailers just love you because of what you've done, uh, you know, helping the retailers, especially lately. What are their thoughts on Kickstarter comic, you know, the Kickstarter comic craze in general? Um, and you you kind of made it a little bit easier on them. But I don't, I've never asked what their thoughts were. I've never asked my local comic shop what their thoughts are, you know? Well, I think, I think for the most part, many of the, the comics that are kickstarted are, um, you know, first of all, I, I, you know, it's not my job to comment on other people's work. Yes. Right? You know, like everybody runs their own race. And, you know, all I really care about is let's make great comics and let's get them into the hands of people that need to read them. And so I don't care how you make comics. Um, if you want to make them on the moon, awesome, right? And in particular, I encourage on Instagram very frequently, you know, if I was starting Boom again, I started Boom in 2005, if I was starting over again, I would probably start with Kickstarter. So um, that it's such a tremendous way to bootstrap your way into publishing, which is a huge cash suck. 
and is very difficult to manage just the cash and getting everybody paid and get, you know, it's, it's operationally extremely difficult. So I think Kickstarter is a boon, but what I'll do is I'll quote card to Angelo, who uh, is a member of comics pro and uh, one of the more outspoken retailers, he's a Los Angeles retailer who owns earth two here. And when I was talking to Carr about what the idea was, was Carr said, most people, what they do is they kickstart a graphic novel and then they'll go serialize it uh, in the direct market. And what Carr remarked ab about that is, it's hard as a retailer to be able to gauge, is all the interest, because it's published first through Kickstarter, is all the interest um, sucked up by Kickstarter? And then there's not gonna be interest in the shops. And, and what Carr said was, instead of putting the cart before the horse, boom, what you've done is you flipped it, where retailers get the comic first, mm -hmm. And then when it gets collected, it goes to Kickstarter. And yeah, so best of both worlds. Can figure out, well, how many Keanu fans do I have? And how many fans do I have of Keanu doing this specific kind of story? And I can order accordingly and, you know, we'll make it returnable so they can find their ceiling. And then they can go sell to comic shop, uh, comic fans. And then when it gets to the collection, you know, then they'll, they'll figure it out from there. But we were, we were focused on people who don't read comics. Yes. Like, I don't want to undermine comic shops. Comic shops have been huge for us. Sales have been gigantic for us. Why would we poop in that punch bowl? Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any sense. And the, the book market is something that's been gigantic for us as well. And we found the readership in the book market is a different demo. You know, it's not a Wednesday warrior. I'm a proud Wednesday warrior. You know, it's, it's not the same audience. You know, what I would say there's a lot of audience there that they get busy and they can't get to the shop. You know, now maybe some of my background will be showing where it's like, I got married and I got kids and I can't get to the store and I'm interested in reading the story. Yes. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go buy it at Barnes and Noble on Friday. And, you know, this is pre-pandemic obviously, but I'm gonna go down Saturday, I'm gonna get a Starbucks and I'm gonna walk the dog and take the kids and they'll rifle around in the bookstore and I'll teach them the love of reading and I get to pick up a graphic novel uh, amongst with a couple other things I've heard about. And then everybody goes back home, you know, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah. So, you know, it just has a different uh, consumer pattern. And so the uh, different audiences for different things. Yeah, I agree. I, I love the fact that um, Kickstarter is there. I love the fact that it's helping a lot of creators um, put out the work they want to put out. But I also love the fact that the way that you've done it helps the re the, the the local comic shops at the same time because i you know lately we've heard you know news about just dis distribution and all this this stuff that's going on and a lot of the comic shops were really worried and i could see um with kickstarter how they it makes me even more worried but the key is to find that best of both worlds to help them both because Listen, if, if more people don't find out about comics, you're going to lose your shop if, you know, if because you're not going to be selling more books. Um, it's always great to to grow the medium and you're going to get a lot of new comic fans, which we are getting an influx right now already. The, our hobby is is booming. It's unreal how how big our hobby has gotten. Well, and, and I'll go with an anecdote here. You know, Larry from Larry's Comics hit me on social and Larry was like, man, I'm getting phone calls from people that want to order this Keanu Reeves comic that have never read comics before. And, you know, I don't know, you know, it, it's, it's, to me, it's amazing because my dream is, I mean, put yourself in my position, <laughs> right? You're sitting on a couch, Keanu Reeves is standing in front of you and he's acting out the story, right? And you're, you're having an out of body experience of like, how did I get here? Right. But don't think about it too hard because it might go away. <laughs> Just say yes. Right. And then you get home and you're going to bed and you're going through your day and you're like, well, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. How do you get you know, my dream was always like I always had these friends. You know, here's a bad example is like one of my best buddies went went with me to see the first X-Men movie, uh, Brian Singer, first X-Men movie. Yeah. And he comes back to my apartment and he says, huh. That's pretty cool. Um, maybe you could give me an X-Men comic and I'd read it. Right. Well, what the hell do I give them? Yeah. You get, you, right? 
and I love Marvel. My friends, I'm friend. I got a million friends at Marvel. Great company, but there was not an easy sort of like you know here read this. Yeah. It wasn't like like when you saw the Tim Burton Batman movie. It was like you could hand somebody Return of the Dark Knight and Killing Joke, and it was like these you know back then it was uh, Arkham Asylum, right? Mm -hmm. You could hand them these clean things that you could be like, oh, I can read this. But it's like the it's such an intimidating taxonomy. Yeah. Of, how do you get somebody who's never read comics before? Well, with this, it's like, here's a can, here's Keanu created this, you know? Well, let's, Keanu I want to talk about that. I, Cause you really picked my, pique my interest with talking about Keanu talking, talking about this. How did Berserker come? Like, how did it get started? Let's talk about that. I want to pick your brain. I want to get some goodies on this. Sure, sure, sure. Well, so, you know, there's an entertainment portion to boom. And so there are seven people that their job is our entertainment division. And we have a first look uh, deal with Netflix for TV. And uh, we have a feature film deal with, it, it was at the time, it was with 20th Century Fox, and that was bought by Disney. And the way that that has kind of split out is they didn't buy all of the 20th Century Fox assets. And so basically Fox News, they didn't buy, they didn't buy Fox the Channel. They didn't buy Fox Sports. So those entities are still called Fox and they've been split out, okay. right? And what was left was what's called 20th Century. And so we just had a movie come out from 20th Century called The Empty Man a couple uh, weekends ago that Boom produced and made. So we are film producers. I produced uh, Two Guns. We have a TV show that's in the hopper, uh, which is called Just Beyond. It's by R.L. Stein, the creator of Goosebumps. I was, we're going to get into that later, guys. Trust me. It's being made as a TV show for Disney+. Plus. We have another show that's getting made that has not been announced. So you can jump on that. Um, and, and, and forgive the pun. You can speculate on what it might be. I'm in no way encouraging you to speculate uh, uh, as you buy comics. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be here all week. Tip your waitresses. This is my dad humor. So uh, I've got kids. I'm, I get my dad humor. Yeah, you got so, a free pass. Thank you. Uh, whether people like it or not. <laughs> and, um, and so uh, we have an office on the lot of 20th Century. And um, I could tell you the range of meetings I've had that go in the super secret vault of incredible movie stars and directors and such that um, – happened and many things never come to fruition. Mm -hmm. And we got the call. Keanu Reeves wants to come in. He wants to talk to you about a comic book project. So that's super exciting. And so Keanu came in and literally sitting in my office on the couch and Keanu is so um, passionate and earnest. Um, he's single, he's insanely brilliant. That's something that's really hard to describe is how multidimensional he thinks and how disciplined he is. Um, you, like we did so much story work on this thing. I want to say that I attended probably six story conferences that were four to five hours each. And I, my editor in chief, uh, Matt Gagnon and Eric Harburn and Stephen Christie, who Stephen runs the entertainment division, they all went to more story conferences than me. I mean, the one of the one of the best quotes from this process was we were talking about uh, getting together on a Saturday uh, on the on the movie lot, and uh, Keanu said, "We'll begin with coffee, and we'll we'll end with bourbon." And I, we were like, "I I think he wants to go all day." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so you're ready to spend your Saturday with Keanu breaking story, and you know he is so well read and thinks multidimensionally about the mythology of the characters and the emotions. But part of it is him as a, how do I, I want to say a storyteller, he thinks with his body. And so the way that he pitched this originally is he stood up and he, he put his fists in the air and he said, and I promise you this is exactly what he did. He, he mimed that he was punching through someone's chest and he said, I just want to punch through somebody's chest. I just want to do that story. And then he was like, 
here's a couple of different fragment ideas, and this is how I think they can tie together. And then if we do this, we can start in ancient Babylon, and then we'll kind of, I've got this idea about World War One, and then there's some fragments from the present. But I mean, it's pretty much the story that he pitched in that first meeting. I love it. I love it. I'm geeking out over this, like because I could see him doing this. You know what I mean? You, you, you could picture him doing this. It and- looked like that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, yeah, what is, has does he has he talked to you about his relationship with comics in general? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it was mind blowing that he in that first meeting, he gets to the end, and he goes, and we'll get Raphael Grandpa to do the cover. Now wow. think about how well read he needs to be in comics. That, you know that he name. knows who Raphael Grandpa is and knows that. And and by the way, that was a gang sign, right? He was telling us, "I know comics." Yeah, he was. He, right? He's calling his shot, right? He's like, "I'm going to get you," and I'm going to right there. And then if you argue with me, well, it's on, right? Because I have an opinion. Yeah, right? and. He tells these stories about buying uh, Frank Miller's Wolverine Limited series off the rack. And I think through the years, he's sort of been in and out and in and out. And of course, he's busy, right? Yeah. And he's in some part of the world and you can't get to a comic shop and whatever. And it's not easy to take your comic collection with you, right? Um, but <clears throat> he knows all of the major. You know, when you think about the time he spent with the the Wachowskis across three Matrix movies, and I'm just going to point out the Wachowskis were comic book writers. They worked on Clive Barker's Barkerverse at Marvel in the early 90s Mm -hmm. uh, before they were screenwriters. And so uh, I know that, you know, Jeff Darrow and uh, Steve Scrooge, I think it's Scrooge, um, both worked on um, the Matrix. And so Keanu had interactions with them. So there's just all these touch points. And, um, you know, it's obviously an idiom that he's very comfortable with, uh, you know, because he was happy to walk into a comic book company and go, like, here's the comic I want to do. I think that's great. I think it's cool. I think that Keanu Reeves has, over the years, become, um, for whatever reason, he went from being this, you know, considered kind of like a goofy kind of, you know, maybe not smart actor and, uh, you know, heavy on Bill and Ted, right? You know, we think about Bill and Ted to yep. being one of the most respected, um, thought about as being one of the smartest, uh, like just really good guys in, and not just in Hollywood in general. Like you think about the good guys and, and, and Keanu Reeves is one of those guys that pops up. Um, and he's never, you never see him in, in, you know, the, the tabloids, he's very private. Very um, private. yeah. And well, I have a lot of respect for him. It's you, should, you know, I was really impressed through this entire process. You know, one of the stories I would tell you is, um, I remember him coming in for the first meeting and, um, you know, you have that little moment when he walks into reception and you don't want to keep him waiting. Right. But at the same time, you're scrambling around because there's this part of you that's like panicking where you're like, oh, my God, there's this movie star in the other room. And like, I can't wait to get him in and sit him down. But like, what if I get him in and sit him down? And like, what am I going to say? Yeah. Right? You're kind of freaking out. You're like, I'm thinking like Kermit and the Muppet show. You're like, ah. Right. <laughs> and so so he had this moment at reception that we tried to make as short as possible, not keep him waiting. Well, he comes in for the second meeting. It's like, you know, two weeks later or whatever. And um, he comes in. And he starts talking to our assistant and he goes, I'm going to get this wrong, but it's some version of how's your dog? How's your friend? And he recalled all of these details from talking to our assistant in the first time when he was waiting, right? I can't remember what my wife told me yesterday. I was just about to say that is a very uh, honorable thing to be able to do. Like, I'll come back from the grocery store and totally forget to get onions and my wife wants to murder me, right? <laughs> and this guy, this is one of the biggest movie stars of all time, and he's remembering all these details about his previous conversation he just had with our assistant. And I mean, he that's, you know, that's just a, a great example. Like I would reference some podcast and he'd pull out his journal and write it down. And then the next meeting, he went and listened to the podcast and he has an opinion. That's awesome. You That's know? so great. Yeah. 
But but one of the things I point out to your audience is it's not an accident that he's as successful as he is. No. Because he pays attention and he listens and he applies himself. And, you know, to me, that that I think is life and career advice, which is yeah. like, you know, my editor in chief would say, keep your blade sharp. Yes. So pay attention, practice, you know, take it seriously. And I think you see that discipline. And that's how he has been able to be so successful for 30, 35 years is that he just applies himself and, 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 um, and on every level. And, and on top of it, he's a really good person. It seems like so a lot of these people, uh, you, you don't know. And like I said, he's very private, but you, no, he's a good person by his actions. Like I've heard stories of him finishing, uh, I think it was like John Wick and he went and found all his stunt guys and he bought them all Harleys, you know, and, and said, thank you. You know, like you hear stories like this, there's multiple stories about him doing this um, out there for just no, it, it's, it's amazing to hear stuff like that from people that are in that situation. Usually we hear the opposite and Keanu has always been a guy that, is on seems like he's on the up and up he's a good dude well i'll, I'll give you contrasting um celebrity stories so we did a comic book a while back with sam jackson oh i love sam and jackson I, and i love i love sam jackson and sam was everything that you wanted him to be like uh -huh. you want sam jackson to cuss way too much and sam jackson cusses way too much right <laughs> sorry sam no you know you're fine so um the uh but i know that sam meets a million people right and it's hard to keep track of who everybody is mm -hmm. right? and so what sam started to do was to call me mr boom okay now that's one of the proudest moments of my life <laughs> is being named mr boom by sam jackson okay now i know that the reason that sam called me mr boom was because he did not remember my name mm -hmm. okay and I'm totally cool with the fact that Sam Jackson forgot my name because Sam's got a lot to do. Yeah. Right? And so if you're ever playing Xbox and somebody shoots you and runs by laughing and they're named Mr. Boom, it's me. Okay. That's my handle on everything. Everywhere is Mr. Boom. All right. I, I love it. Mr. Boom out enough. Right. <laughs> um, but the flip side is, you know, Keanu did this New York comic con video about berserker. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like a 13 year old schoolgirl and giggled in my seat when he talked about, you know, working with Matt Gagnon and Eric Harburn and Ross Ritchie. And I just kind of was like, yeah, he knows my name. I'm so excited. So, you know, he, I just can't, I can't say enough wonderful things about Sam Jackson, whom I adore and would work with again in a heartbeat. It was a great experience, but you know, all the stories about Keanu from what I, it's consistent with my experience. He was, kind, generous, thoughtful. Yeah. I, I want to let everybody know, and I want to ask, it's, it, uh, it looks like you guys still have the ability to, for people to go to the Kickstarter. Um, it says late backers click oh, here. Right. So, yep. Yeah. So let's see, um, for all you guys that are watching this, uh, hopefully this will still be, um, available to you guys. If you know, make sure you guys go check. If you guys want to, um, get part of, be part of this Kickstarter, make sure you guys go, uh, take a look at it. Um, it's, it's it's a worthy cause on top of being a sounds like being a great story and uh, why wouldn't you want to support um, Boom Studios and Keanu Reeves at the same time? So make sure you guys go check that out. Well, well, and what I would say is support your local comic shop. Yes, that's the important thing. Let's keep these stores in business. Um, if there's Kickstarter beyond that, great. But that's the cherry on top. The primary course is take care of your local comic shop. Amen. Amen. And what's kind of, I want to uh, get into that a little bit because over the past, I would say year, year and a half, Boom has really put out a lot of major books that um, will kind of get back to the speculator thing uh, that me as being a part of the, the Flipside channel and, and CBSI have keyed in on. A lot of Boom books over the past two years have been in our hot 10 list. And um, some of those books I just want to talk about real quick because uh, they're they're really great books um, on both levels. Um, one of them is uh, Something is Killing the Children. And yes, uh, that book is just blowing up. It is by far one of the best 
looking books out there. Um, the character design, everything about it, and uh, with the covers, it's been front and central, the character design. And that really grabs you. And I think that's very important for a comic book to have that character design and something to grab them. And Something Killing the Children is beyond one of those books. Uh, the cover artist that you guys have on that book, the, the like I said, the characters. I'm going to keep saying that character design because it's so good. Well, that's um, Werther, by the way. You know, Werther, the artist, uh, is the one that designed Erica. And certainly James had the idea, but the visual character design, the display with the, you know, the gator, Mm -hmm. uh, that's Werther. So, you know, credit where credit is due and, you know, Werther does spectacular covers and then we have, you know, the Jenny Frizzens and, you know, tremendous talents that come in and grace us uh, with the covers. So we're, we're nothing without our creators. We're only thankful and, um, you know, have tremendous gratitude for uh, the stories they tell. Uh, but th those folks really cracked that one open. Um, yeah. And, and you talked about Frizzen and Jenny Frizzen is, one of the most amazing artists in comics. And uh, I hearken back, I was gonna try and grab it. It's, with, it's like if I had my go-go gadget arm, I could grab it, that NYCC <laughs> uh, variant um, yep. with, the, with the foil covers. And just that cover is so, I feel like it's one of, it's an, it's an iconic cover. It yep. really is. And yep. uh, man, you guys really did a good job. Let's talk about the story. Can you tell, can you give a little hint for people out there that don't know much about something as a killing the children? You don't want to give them too much, but listen, right. yeah. So, uh, so our story begins with, uh, a bunch of, uh, teenage boys sort of in that junior high, early high school age range, and they are having a slumber party and they're decide to dare each other. And uh, our lead character, James, who might have a first name in common with the writer of the story, James Tynan, mm -hmm. who might physically look a bit like the writer of the comic book, James Tynan. But I'm not saying it's James Tynan, but the lead character is named James and does look like him. But um, is uh, they, you know, basically the, the boys all challenge each other to go out into the into the woods. And, you know, let's just cue the title of the series. You know, something's killing the children. So, um the hook here is adults can't see the monster. So good. So only kids can. And so the kids go and say, there's something killing the children. And all the adults say is, uh, well, monsters don't exist. And that's yeah, crazy. All bad, yeah. And so that cue Erica Slaughter coming to town. And so you've seen the character design. She shows up. Uh, I'm not going to say how. And um, you'll have to figure out who she's talking to. Uh, both when she's alone and uh, when she's on the phone. So I'll tease those two because uh, they're both pretty whack, pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah. So, it's um, beyond yeah. good. Listen, uh, I, I don't think there's many people that are going to watch this that don't know about something is killing the children. But if you haven't, you know, picked up this book, if you haven't looked into it, you guys can go to Boom Studios um, website and there's a free preview that you guys can check out. So make sure you guys definitely go do that. Uh, well, and let me just say the sales on this book are completely bananas. Um, I think it was the 11th or the 12th issue outsold the 11th. Okay. Yeah. And then the is sales on issue 12 are insane. Mm. And then, uh, we sold out of a gigantic print run on the first collection graphic novel and then just went back to press with a really big print run and we think that's going to vaporize pretty quick uh so it is pretty staggering the amount of support and excitement i mean people are jumping on this series by the tens of thousands yes yes and so um it's stunning um one of the things that's really? very interesting, uh, it's funny because you brought up number 11, and I'm going to um, shout out to comicbookinvest.com. I just want to, for those of you guys that don't know, comicbookinvest.com does a hot 10 list. And this was the hot 10 list from a, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, Something Killing the Children, number 11, the 1 in 100 variant was on this list. I want to talk a little bit about um, getting to kind of like the variant thing and pick your brain a little bit on this. And it was it blew me away that a book – um that is you know in issue 11 had a one in 100 variant but that has to say a lot about a something that's uh issue 11 that is selling like copies like that right so uh, can you can you give us a little idea on how that works with with print runs and stuff and variants and and i know that's something that you kind of want to talk about 
um, uh, you've, you've, you've kind of brought it up a little bit. What is, how do you feel about print runs and, and kind of like the little bit of the, the secrecy that might be around them? Well, you know, I'm going to demythologize some of that. That's um, what I want. So a lot of it is a lot more uh, sort of mortal than you think it is. Hmm. So I'll give you an example of how did that uh, variant originate. Okay. So uh, James was launching Department of Truth at Image. And he got Werther, uh, his Something is Killing the Children collaborator, <clears throat> to do a tribute to Something is Killing the Children first issue. So, so James is commissioning his for Department of Truth at Image. He's commissioning his Something is Killing the Children artist to do a cover that is an homage to Something is Killing the Children for Department of Truth. So it looks like the cover of Something is Killing the Children number one, but it says Department of Truth on it. And it has the red hooded lady from Department of Truth on it instead of Erica Slaughter, right? And so James says to us, look at this. This is really cool. Let's swap. Oh, Why man. don't you do one on something is killing the children that is an homage to Department of Truth? Okay. And so we're like, oh, okay, cool. Right. And James made that variant on Department of Truth a one in 100. And so we were like, well, we got to make ours a one in 100. I love that. I think I think things like that are awesome. Um, it for the collector, and let's be honest. Like a, a, a lot of us are when either we join com, we get into comics because we're collectors, or we become collectors, right? Um, and when comic companies do, uh, publishers do things like this, you know, to to kind of peak that collector intellect, that collector thing. And I'm telling you, something is killing the children is become fans out there are rabid for this book. And this type of thing, like it really helps that. I, I love stuff like this. Well, you know, what we're doing is we're listening to our creator, right? And he's proposing an idea that we're accommodating. Now we're not omniscient geniuses, mm. right? So we were rolling the dice. You know, we could have sold two copies of the one in 100 and been screwed, right? That, that like nobody bit. And what we're just trying to do is try to make stuff fun. You know, like, it. how does it feed the story? How do you feel as a fan when you buy it? Do you feel like it, somebody put thought into it? You know, I've been publishing for 15 years. I've won Eisner Awards, Harvey Awards, Glad Awards. I've won a bunch of awards. I've also got a ton of scars on my back. Like I have a million things that I tried and nobody bought it and nobody cared and nobody ever remembers that, right? It's like everybody remembers the stuff that works and the stuff that hits, but you have to experiment and you have to yes. try different things and certain things work and certain things don't. And this was a very happy accident that totally turned out, excuse me, I mean, I'm a super genius and I know what I'm doing. Um, you know, you just gotta try stuff and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't and you need to be careful and not to jeopardize the project so that it doesn't destroy or make it too expensive or like ruin things. Well, that's- I'm all about rolling the dice and trying new things and you know, when stuff doesn't work, you walk away from it. And sometimes it breaks your heart, but sometimes it works and it hits and everybody's excited and happy and, Yay. Yeah. You, one of the things that you just mentioned, you know, you, you, you kind of, you have all these things that, that don't work. Um, and this kind of gets me back into the print run thing. Um, uh, sometimes then when it doesn't work and you've got a huge print run like that. Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you're going to think twice. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, speculators, we try to hearken back on the print run stuff, and we say, "Oh, we want to know the print run. We want to know the print run." Right. What is your thoughts on that? Like when it comes totally to, been to my Instagram, there I was all these I guys will, that drive by the Instagram profile, and they're like, "What's the print run?" Yes, exactly. Yeah. And and I have it's funny you say that because I have your Instagram up, yeah. so you know people are. And, and that's another place like Instagram has become a big place for comic speculators to, to reach out to each other. So I imagine you're getting a lot of that. Um, well, and well, what's interesting to me about, and I would encourage folks to go to my personal Instagram, which is Ross underscore Richie, uh, R O S S underscore R I C H I E. There's no T no E Y and Richie. And, um, 
I sort of have some fun where like on Saturday, one of the things I did was there's all this heat around lumberjanes and I was watching, you know, we got a show coming up. I mean, I'm saying we have a show coming on. We have a uh, um, possibility of an HBO max uh, cartoon. Yes. And so there's a lot of back issue heat that's around lumberjanes. Yes. That's it. It's the yellow square in the middle. And so what I did was um, I was watching a YouTube show. And they were talking about the back issue heat that's on the, the web store exclusive on issue one. And they said that it was 250 copies. And it was the smallest print run Lumberjanes number one variant. And I knew that that wasn't true. And I don't know where they got the information from. And they're good folks who work really hard and are very smart. And so I thought, well, if I'm a fan, I would actually like to know if that's not true. And I don't have the ability to correct it other than to put a post up on Instagram that clarifies what are the print runs of the rarest Lumberjanes variants. And so I, you know, the book is eight years old. And so I personally like to keep current print runs under the hat uh, most of the time uh, because there's a proprietary uh, mm -hmm. component to that and some uh, creator components to it. And so it's like, let's just, not talk specifically about that specific print run information, but when time goes by and it's not as current, I'm comfortable. And so here was an opportunity and I thought, well, I can help fans understand. And so the web store actually had 500 units, not 250. And there was actually a large number. I think there's like six books that we did that had 500 print run on it. So it's one, it's more of a one of like a half dozen books that are the rarest variants. Yeah. And so basically I think I run down eight or nine of the lowest print run variants um, that are on that book. And so I like to dip my toe in the water and try to clarify. I can't always do it. I certainly don't have the time, um, but, yeah. but when I do, good. I try and I try to help. Uh, so folks uh, know and understand uh, because, you know, you want to correct the information. You know, I, I had a little fun a while back. This has been maybe two or three months ago where I put up the shortest print run, something is killing the children variants but I didn't uh, stipulate uh, what the print run was, but I just said these five are the lowest print run. Uh, and I, I don't think I've done it for Once in Future, uh, but it would be fun to go through and do it for Seven Secrets and Once in Future, and uh, we only find them when they're dead. So in my well, copy of time, I'll get to that. On behalf of the community, that uh, the speculator community, um, I'll, I'll speak for the rest of them. That type of thing, you doing this type of stuff helps immensely. We understand 100% why they, you know, publishers can't always give the print runs. But doing stuff like this um, is a big uh, help to the community because we love finding out information like this. We love to find out these, well, these lore, books. right? Yes. So you want to know the lore. And here's the thing: is you know, you guys can take advantage of it, but retailers can too. Yeah. You know, retailers can be on the Instagram; they can see the post. I know my old friend Cal from Strange Adventures uh, uh, up in Nova Scotia in Canada. He's one of the first guys that ever bought any books from Boom back in 2005. Uh, he was like the first retailer that backed me. And he's on my Instagram and he's reading this information all the time. And so it helps the retail community. It helps the fans. It helps the collectors. Yes. Uh, you know, I just want to be really, you know, judicious and careful about the information that I hand out. And I love helping fans and I love helping collectors. I collect comics. I've got a back issue collection. I have those Silver Age books that I bought, you know, from my speculation days 30 years ago that I still have. Um, and so, you know, I want to support the community and I just want to make sure that we do it in such a way that we don't step on each other's toes. Yes. And I think that's amazing. And we appreciate it big time. Um, one more thing that I want to talk about is you've got something that you're which is really cool, and I'm a little jealous that you're you're starting, which is a long form uh, show slash podcast, yeah. where you talk to creators like one on one, and I love stuff like this. I think it's something that is really missing um, in the community, uh, and to have both you know the visual and you're going to do it audio, hopefully also. Yeah, yeah, I'm 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 doing it all on my own, so I'm kind of blundering my way through it. So. Uh, I got to figure out that piece, but I, 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 my plan is, you know, it's a two to three hour one-on-one uh, -on -one creator interview, me and the creator. The first creator I'm doing is James Tyne on the fourth. 
And uh, the second creator is Kieran Gillen. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Kieran, the creator of Once and Future and Wicked and Divine and a million other things. Wicked and, and Divine is one of my top 10 all-time favorite series. Well, it's a, it's the most amazing thing. During the interview, I was I was saying to him, like, you know, well, this is clearly one of the most transcendent, brilliant pieces of comic book graphic novel work of the past 20, 30 years. And you saw this little moment where he was like, do you think so? And I was like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, don't worry, bro. I will call you every day and tell you you're a genius. You're a genius. Yeah, so, yeah. Anyway, the um, uh, you know, for me, I get a lot of questions on Instagram about breaking in. And I think about when I was growing up in the community, the stories that were told about breaking in and the opportunities for breaking in were much more pervasive. And I don't know what's happened. I think, you know, with print going the way of the dodo, you know, you don't have Wizard Magazine, you don't have Comic Buyer's Guide, you don't have these things from the 80s and the 90s that were everywhere that really told people how to break in. And so the sort of notion that I had was, let's talk about how these creators break in. It's usually a unicorn, just like my story, something that's never replicated, but that we can stop and talk about what are the life skills that uh, contributed to the opportunities. And so, you know, with Kieran's story, one of the things he broke in as a video game journalist first, and then that got him an opportunity to write some comics. And um, with Kieran, and by the way, I, I, I want to point my, I have my first issue of Once a Future Theater on my desk, but what I pulled down from my wall, if you look at my, the, the background here. Hold on, let me, yeah, let me, let me get this because I want to see this, yeah. yeah. Let's see if I can put it in the background. So there's something missing here because I pulled down to show you in my office is I actually oh. have the original cover. So this oh. is fair because I knew when the cover came in before anybody saw it, I was like, okay, I got to buy that. Um, <laughs> but um, so I love not, OA. I love it. But yeah, he, he, you know, Dan Mora is a super genius and a, a brilliant talent and an incredibly kind human being as uh, one of my favorite people. Um, but so I was talking to Kieran and Kieran was saying how he broke into video game journalism was he talked, uh, he wrote letters into the magazine and it was a Amiga power. I think is the name of the magazine that was published in the UK and it had a real sort of um, funny tone. And so what he did was he wrote in that tone and what happened was the editors started to think, well, you know what? You could probably write for the magazine. And what happened was they had a short deadline and they needed a flunky, right? To like grind out an article and they offered it to him. And that was his moment, right? And it's not a moment to demand all the money in the world. And it's not a moment to demand they meet your deadline. You got to just get in there and do it. Yeah. And he did, and that was his rocket ship, and he spent the 90s being a journalist and then made the transfer in the mid-aughts uh, to writing comics. And, you know, and he, he goes into it in the interview, and the interview is, like, gigantic. We went into the minutia. The other part is um, I know for fans that love Wicked Divine and love these series like Something is Killing Children, like, think about creative process, right? What are the influences? How does your creativity get um, first awoken? Uh, what are things that are influences on your voice? You know, uh, the Tynan interview, he talks pretty extensively about uh, Neil Gaiman as well as Stephen King. And um, it's just fascinating. I think other writers would enjoy it. I think other publishers, I think artists, I think people that are interested in creative things. And so it's just a, you know, probably a way too self-indulgent uh, sort of, you know, uh, creative work process thing that we're doing. And um, we're well, going to not, not on, sorry, not to interrupt. Uh, I apologize. But not only that, um, hearing there's a lot of young artists out there uh, that don't get this information. And I am friends, uh, you know, obviously we work in this community. We know a lot of guys who want to be comic artists or who are comic artists. And one of the things that you don't have anymore is a lot of these guys got their start by going to cons and showing work or 
you know, writers yep. would, uh, you know, submit their stuff to public. You, you don't have that anymore. And you just gave a story of kind of about networking and how important networking is in our community. I, I personally, I think that networking should be like a class they teach high school kids because it is the most important thing, in my opinion, that you can learn in a business world. Yep. And that is kind of what you're, you're showing is, hey, how did these guys get in? Let's tell the younger guys. And that is a perfect example of something they may not know how important networking is. Absolutely. And I just think about when I was at Malibu and I was a young pup and how supportive the older generation was of me, the Walter Simonsons and Howard Shakens and Barry Windsor Smiths. And then, you know, the, the other thing I think about is how I broke in, which is I was just having a conversation at a convention. And somebody who had a job opportunity offered it to me. And it wasn't me walking up and going like, knock, knock, hire me, right? Yeah. Uh, which can be a little off-putting. Oh, right? I bet, yeah. Uh, now, sometimes it's necessary. So yeah. you know, some people break in like that. Uh, but it is, it, it is that art of networking and having an organic relationship and having community and conversations and those sorts of things. And you know, I noticed there's a thread in our conversation about having community. But I, I, I want to be aware of the fact that I'm probably overstaying my welcome. So. No, you're not. This is great. I love this. I love this conversation. Um, I can't thank you enough for um, creating another uh, forum for not only people to these creators to talk about their stuff, because like I said, my favorite thing is to find out this information about creators. I want to know, did you write any letters into comics when you were a kid? I want to know your first professional work so I can go find it. I, I want to know that stuff. I want to know little you know, the little nuances um, about the industry I love. And there is not a place for that. Where can, when, when this, uh, where can people find this, um, this interview and, and whatnot? Well, I'm putting it out under Ross Ritchie okay. on YouTube. And so uh, you can go uh, search that and we'll have it in the description for sure. Terrific. And then we can get that link in there and you can go check it out. There's also some shorter form videos that I imported from my Instagram account, which is just more general breaking in advice. Uh, yes. People saying, hey, publish me, me talking about sort of, you know, what does that mean? Submissions, all that sorts of stuff. So um, that could be our creator resource blog, uh, sort of vlog. Well, I want to end on kind of one favorite that I had a lot of people asking me about. And, and um, it, we're getting to a time period where I'm not the model for Erica Slaughter. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> no, everybody's been talking about that. That's not true. All right. I think we know who that is now. Right. Um, uh, the the Power Rangers have. When I was growing up, it, for me, it was GI Joe and Star Wars. Right. Yep. There was to me when I think of my kid childhood, I think it's GI Joe instantly. That's what I think about. And yep. for people who are kind of uh, getting to that disposable income age right now, for them. It's Power Rangers. Yep. And Boom Studios has done something for me, which I didn't think was possible. And that is make the Power Rangers relevant to somebody who grew up in a G.I. Joe era. Because me too. Me too. Like, those look, comics <laughs> are awesome. I'll tell you, uh, look, here's the thing. Bryce Carlson, who's um, VP and editorial here, uh, he started off as my assistant. Okay. So I know Bryce really well. And he migrated into the editorial department as the company grew. So he came in and he goes, I really want to license the Power Rangers. And for me, I'm too old. And so I was like, oh, that's cool. Uh, why? And he basically broke it down. And he said, you know, we can do a comic that is, um, you know, like what it, Bryce was basically saying, when I watched the show as a kid, it was serious as cancer to me, mm. right? And then I got older and I went back and I watched it and I saw that it was kind of campy and goofy. And what I want to do is I want to make a show, excuse me, a comic that's what I thought the show was, which was serious as cancer. Like, let's make a badass superhero comic and respect the lore and do it right. And I believe in Bryce. And so I said, okay, let's go do it. And, uh, you know, Boom is the result of a lot of teamwork. Um, we have a lot of different editors. We have a lot of different marketing folks that put ideas forward. And many of them get through. 
And we, we will go pursue things that this isn't all necessarily just the Ross Ritchie show, right? So we'll take chances, we'll do things. Um, and Bryce was the guy that put this forward. And I remember sitting down in my office and reading the first issue and going to Bryce and saying, this is an amazing superhero comic. I really don't know anything about the Power Rangers and I love this. And I would buy the second issue if I was in stores. So uh, if I was a fan, you know, just buying it off the rack. So uh, I'm really proud of what that team's done. They've worked really hard. They're super excited. We, you know, it's a, we're relaunching the franchise with new number ones. It's a great opportunity to, for folks to jump in. Yeah, I, I can't uh, say enough about what um, has happened with that, uh, that whole, the whole Power Rangers, Power Rangers in my head have exactly that turned into something that was a little campy uh tv show f for kids back in the day to some really good storytelling um i love the crossovers that you guys are doing i thank think that's genius um yeah thank you ross for just just thank you for doing this interview yeah. thank you for for the stuff that's coming in the future we really appreciate it and we couldn't have uh, asked for a better interview and hopefully we can get you on again and uh hear about some other stuff because i've got a lot of other questions that i could i could run down and uh, right. i'm sure we'll, a lot we'll of people love to hear it we'll do the sequel and um you know let me tell your audience again support your local comic shop support your local retailer Yes, please do that. And make sure you guys keep an eye on YouTube uh, for Ross Ritchie and his interview series coming out. Uh, you said James uh, Tynan's going to be the first, uh, yep. Kieran Gill in the second. You guys don't want to miss those. I'm telling you, two great creators that are doing great stuff. And, and of course, Boom Studios, which uh, we can't thank more. Thank you, Ross. Thank you so much. Take care.